Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program today called Know Our Providers. My name is Jeff Umwenger. I'm actually a nurse practitioner and I'm also the business development manager with Florida Lung and Asthma Sleep Specialists. Now today, I'm very glad to introduce to you one of our renowned providers, Dr. Donald Elton. Just as information, with Florida Lung and Asthma Sleep Specialists, we do have four locations very well located in the general area of Orlando and Kissimmee. Our first office, the corporate main office, is in Polynesia, which is just right off 535 and Osceola Parkway. We do have another office off Orange Avenue and Michigan near downtown Orlando, another office in Winter Garden, and also right here in Point Sierra. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Dr. Donald Elton. He is board certified in pulmonary care and also serves in critical care privileges at Celebration and Poinciana Hospital. Dr. Alton, welcome. Thank you. Now, today we're going to discuss a very current and hot topic, which is COVID-19. You've been very instrumental in this area here. As a matter of fact, Dr. Alton was actually recently recognized as the physician of the year at Poinciana Medical Center and we applaud you for that. Thank you. So Dr. Alton, let me ask you the first question. Many have suffered from the effects of the COVID-19 disease and many actually have lost their lives. Please explain how COVID-19 affects people. Sure. Half the people that get COVID-19 don't have any symptoms and that's one of the insidious problems is they can be contagious for a week or so without having any idea that they're sick so they don't really modify their behavior and other people don't modify their behavior around those people so that's a problem it's great that they don't have symptoms but it's also bad that they don't have symptoms because they're contagious of the people that have symptoms the the majority of them have typical flu symptoms with fever cough congestion weakness muscle aches not feel like doing anything uh, loss of smell and taste that sort of thing and that usually passes within a week a small minority of patients will develop problems with their breathing and some will eventually require hospitalization. And of those hospitalized, about 10% will not survive. So that seems to be the, the sticking point. The people that get serious illness usually have it come in the second or third week of the illness after they're actually over the viral part of the illness. Hmm. Very interesting. So now, on top of that, some people actually test negative. Only to test positive maybe a few days or even weeks later. So now are these tests really, you know, are they, can we believe them? Are they reliable? The, the tests are reasonably reliable, but the timing is very important. It takes up to five days or so for a test to turn positive after initial infection. So if you're tested too soon after the exposure, of course the test will be negative. And even when you're beyond the five days, the sensitivity of the test is around 70%. And this varies somewhat with the test and with how good a job the person did collecting the specimen. So when you say a test is 70% sensitive, that means it will show a false negative up to 30% of the time. So in cases that are very suspicious in spite of a negative test, sometimes we repeat the test to improve the uh, accuracy of the diagnosis. Hmm. Wow, that's very important to know. Well, the other question, Dr. Elton, is, you know, it has been a year now since the onset of COVID-19, the pandemic. Uh, what are the long-term effects of the disease in the survivors that you treat? That, that's a good question because we're seeing hundreds of patients in follow-up that we had also seen in the hospital. So we're mainly seeing people in the office that were very sick, uh, enough to require hospitalization and seeing how they do in the months and weeks following the infection. And almost everybody when they come to the office feels much better after a few weeks than when they left the hospital. But this improvement continues for at least three months or so before they get back to close to their baseline. Some patients will get back to 100% within three or four months. Some people may only attain 80 or 90% of the exercise capacity they had before the illness. And time will tell if this is going to improve beyond the five or six months. We suspect for some patients there will be some permanent damage and lifelong difficulty in their exercise performance, but it's really still too soon to know to what extent these people can improve farther. Hmm, interesting. So I think that says that we're still learning a lot about this disease. Now, obviously we hear a lot, you know, about the people with pre-existing conditions, 
being at a higher rate, you know, risk for hospitalization or death from COVID-19. Now, what are the, some of the more important pre-existing conditions important of this disease? The two most important factors seem to be obesity and hypertension. People with cardiovascular disease and uh, end-stage renal disease, dialysis patients also seem to be particularly at risk. Uh, if anything, people with uh, lung disease such as asthma and COPD seem to be underrepresented. And we aren't sure if that's because they have some sort of advantage over the others or because they know they have these diseases and they're just taking more precautions and are therefore less likely to get sick in the first place. Wow. Now, you know, we continue to learn more about this disease, but so far, what are the main treatments, you know, in use today for people ill with COVID-19? Well, the, my, the, the majority of patients don't really need any treatment because they're going to get better no matter what you do. Mm. So symptomatic treatment is the main thing for people that are, that are at home. For the few people that get seriously ill, it is not so much the virus causing direct effects on the system, it's their overactive or exaggerated immune response that creates a huge amount of inflammation that then damages the lungs. So most treatments have been aimed at reducing that inflammation pathway to prevent further damage to the lungs and to give the lungs a chance to heal. The most effective medications we have right now are actually steroids that are very old, very inexpensive medicines, but when we suppress the inflammation, the patients tend to get better and there's clearly a mortality benefit in those patients. Wow, that's good to know. Well, just following up on that one, you know, uh, most people who contract COVID-19 actually never even get to be hospitalized. When should someone who is at, at home known or suspected to have COVID-19 seek medical help? So as I said before, half the people won't have any symptoms. So of course, they have no reason to go to see somebody. The people that have typical flu symptoms with fever and weakness, uh, they don't really need uh, medical care. But the people that are going to get more seriously sick are sooner or later going to have problems with their breathing, either shortness of breath or low oxygen levels. Sometimes the oxygen levels can be fairly low and the patients not even know it. And that's one of the problems. And for many of our patients, we've recommended if they're significantly sick, that they obtain a pulse oximeter so they can see their own oxygen saturation levels. And anybody with COVID-19 who has an oxygen saturation less than 94% on room air uh, needs to be seen at the hospital because they would qualify for treatment such as steroids and some of the other things we do for COVID-19 that are not required for the patients that are not to the point of requiring oxygen therapy. Very well. Now, you know, while so many people have been vaccinated across the country and actually especially very well right here in florida you know there are still some people you know who are afraid of taking the vaccine what advice can you give them in the united states roughly 30 million people have already received the uh, vaccine at least one of the one of the two doses of the currently approved vaccines and a third vaccine from johnson and johnson was just approved and should be starting delivered this week out of all those people, we really don't have any verified vaccine-related deaths or serious side effects. But of course, anytime you vaccinate 30 million people, some of them are going to die from whatever condition they were going to die of, whether they had the vaccine or not. The vaccines have been surprisingly effective, much higher rates of success preventing disease than, say, the flu shot has given traditionally, with as much as 95% effectiveness even one week after receiving the second vaccination. So given that side effects are low, we've not been seeing patients with Guillain-Barre related to the uh, vaccine, allergic reactions are extremely rare. Uh, there's really not a good reason to avoid using the vaccine because without the vaccine, you're really still trapped in your house from a risk standpoint unless you've already had the actual infection. The natural immunity is good as well, probably lasts at least a year, but there's still a lot of unknowns about how long natural or vaccine immunity are going to last. But we can expect at least a year of protection from either one of those, and maybe longer, time will tell. We're really not seeing very many, if any, reinfections at this point, but obviously sooner or later that'll start happening. But I would recommend anybody and everybody get the vaccine as soon as it's available to you. Excellent, excellent. Now, you know, just before we finish, Dr. Alton, you can realize that there's a lot of pandemic fatigue. Now, what are the other advice you can give to people? You know, people wanna live normal lives and stay free from COVID-19. What advice do you have for our general population? Well, at the risk of repeating myself, getting vaccinated is your ticket to a normal life. If you're not vaccinated, there's still plenty of things you can do without putting yourself at increased risk. 
We feel like many infections come from uh, groups in your house with people you don't live with. So if you're in the house with people you don't live with, whether it's extended family or neighbors or friends, there's a good chance the more people that are there, the higher the risk is that, you, that somebody will have the virus. A patient I saw a few days ago went to a party with 10 people and seven of them wound up with coronavirus at the end of that. But there are plenty of things you can do, everything from fishing to beach to outdoor sports and activities that are very safe. It's very difficult to, to get the virus in outdoor activities. But if you go to restaurants where you're in an enclosed space with people that you don't live with, uh, most of the people have to take their mask off to eat and drink, so there's more exposure. Those are higher risk activities as well as house parties. But with the vaccine, uh, there's a lot more freedom in what you can do safely. Wow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. A very interesting conversation with Dr. Elton. We want to thank you, Dr. Elton, for giving us the insight and a little bit more details of COVID-19. And once again, congratulations for your recent, you know, achievement as Physician of the Year at Poinsia Medical Center. Thank you so much to our valued patients. We want to thank you for trusting us to take care of you. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want to find out more information about the services that we provide, please go to www.floridalungdoctors.com. And also, the same video is available in Spanish version. If you would like to hear more about this in Spanish, please click next. Thank you so much.